People have been copying what they see on the big screen since the beginning of cinema, but when a criminal brings a horror movie to life, it makes the world just a little scarier. The following are horror movie scenarios that became a disturbing reality. 1994's Interview with the Vampire rejuvenated the market for tales of bloodsuckers. It tells the story of Louis, a man from 1790s Louisiana who becomes a vampire and how his undead life progresses for the next couple hundred years. On the night after viewing the film, a man named Daniel Sterling was said to have told his girlfriend Lisa Stellwagen that he wanted to kill her and drink her blood. He then stabbed her repeatedly and in fact did drink some of her blood. His defense team would go on to claim that the film had, quote, mesmerized him. They tried to claim insanity by saying that Sterling had lost his mental faculties after viewing the film and that he thought he was a vampire. Stellwagen survived and she was able to testify against Sterling. It turned out that he had been abusive and violent well before the movie, and he was angry that she went out with another man and may have been planning to leave him. The prosecution argued that the reason Sterling drank Stellwagen's blood was most likely so that he could claim insanity when he was inevitably caught. In the end, the jury wasn't convinced by Sterling and found him guilty of attempting to kill Stellwagen. In the world of the Purge franchise, a malicious government regime takes over the United States and then devises a scheme to rid the country of undesirables, a once-a-year holiday dubbed Purge Night, when for 12 hours all crime, including murder, is legal and even encouraged. The government claims that this annual venting of aggression is necessary for the country to function, and it accordingly becomes a big deal that people look forward to. The film hit the zeitgeist hard enough such that the concept of Purge Night took hold in America's consciousness as a critique on class inequality and race relations, among other subjects. Inspired by the concept of the movies, an Indianapolis man named Jonathan Cruz, who was already a career criminal, committed a spree of crimes over several nights in 2016. Between May 12th and 15th, he committed three killings, several robberies, an attempted kidnapping, and more. During that time, he sent text messages to friends and told victims that his actions were inspired by the movies. One message he sent read, I purge every night now. Cruz even recorded himself committing several of his crimes, and he seems to have struck completely at random. He was eventually caught and received a life sentence without parole. In our seven years, we've never seen anything like this. I mean, just the thought that someone would take three innocent lives for sport is just beyond our comprehension. 1973's The Exorcist tells the story of a young girl possessed by a demon and her mother's attempts to save her from the evil inside her. The novel that the film was based on purported to be inspired by a true story of an exorcism that the Catholic Church performed in the 1940s. In 1980, a woman named Patricia Ann Frazier watched the film and 10 days later she killed her four-year-old daughter and even cut out her heart. She claimed that the child had become possessed by demons and watching the movie had given her this idea. After more than a year of drawn-out legal wrangling, Frazier was eventually found not guilty by reason of insanity. Not everyone was convinced by this, though. The prosecution maintained that Frazier had a history of abusing her child and that she was a completely sane, cold-blooded killer. They also claimed that Frazier killed her daughter because she wanted to find a new boyfriend. After her acquittal, Frazier was turned over to the custody of her mother. After the success of Interview with the Vampire, author Anne Rice's Vampire Chronicles book series became a hot commodity. After several failed attempts to launch an adaptation of the sequel novel, The Vampire Lestat, Warner Brothers decided to combine the second and third books into a single movie, Queen of the Damned, released in 2002. While it wasn't very successful with critics or audiences, it is notable as the second and final feature film appearance of R&B singer Aaliyah, who died in a plane crash a few months before the movie's release. Less than a year after The Queen of the Damned came out, a Scottish man named Alan Menzies became obsessed with the movie and claimed to have watched it over a hundred times. He was especially taken with Aaliyah's vampire queen character Akasha, who he said visited him numerous times. When Menzies' neighbor Thomas McKendrick stopped by and in the course of conversation criticized Menzies' obsession with Akasha, Menzies said that she appeared and ordered him to kill McKendrick and drink his blood in order to become a vampire. He stabbed McKendrick to death, drank his blood and ate part of his head, then disposed of the body in the woods. Menzies was found sane at the trial and sentenced to life in prison. Alan did many things for people to question his sanity. He wrote letters home to his family and he would sign them vamp. In the Scream franchise, teens are terrorized by various killers in black robes and a white mask. The killer has been known as Ghostface, no matter who was behind the mask. The film and its sequels reignited the slasher genre and inspired countless knockoffs. In the universe of Scream, one reason the killers are dressed the same way is because the costume is cheap and easy to find. This turned out to also be the case in real life, as the films inspired several copycat crimes across the world where people killed others while dressed in the iconic mask and robes. 
Perhaps the most disturbing one happened in Belgium in 2001. 15-year-old Alison Cambia visited her 24-year-old neighbor Tierra Jardin to return some movies that she had borrowed from him. Jardin made romantic advances toward Cambia, which she rejected. He then excused himself to another room, came back wearing a ghost-faced costume, brutally stabbed her to death, and posed her corpse on his bed. He claimed that the killing was premeditated and that the movies had inspired him. He was sentenced to life in prison. Oliver Stone's 1994 movie Natural Born Killers stars Woody Harrelson and Juliette Lewis as two young criminals who go on a road trip across the United States, causing mayhem and becoming a media sensation along the way. It was heavily criticized at the time of its release due to its violence, but it's attained cult status in the years since. In March 1995, Sarah Edmondson and Benjamin Darris, a couple from Oklahoma, were taking drugs and watching Natural Born Killers over and over when they decided they wanted to commit their own crime spree. They drove to Mississippi when, short on money, they decided to commit their first killing. Darris shot a man named William Savage to death in the office of his business and robbed him for just $100. The next day in Louisiana, Edmondson shot a convenience store clerk in the neck during a robbery, severing her spinal cord and rendering her quadriplegic. Edmondson and Darris then returned to Oklahoma where they were caught and sentenced to prison, Darris for life and Edmondson for 35 years. They admitted that the film inspired their crimes, and the family of buyers even filed suit against director Oliver Stone and Warner Brothers, though the case was thrown out. The long-running Saw series features gruesome traps, a creepy puppet, and eerie videos in which the Jigsaw Killer explains his motives. In 2007, two 13-year-old Tennessee girls were attempting to imitate the Jigsaw Killer's threatening recordings when they randomly prank-called a woman named Beverly Dixon and left her a voicemail. The girls used many of the same lines from the films in the message, in which they informed Dixon that one of her friends was trapped in her house and toxic gas would be released if she didn't free the friend in 10 minutes. While this might sound like a corny prank that wouldn't fool many people, it nevertheless resulted in tragedy. Dixon didn't listen to the message until the following day while she was at a funeral. Hearing the threats along with the stress of the funeral caused her to panic and have a stroke. She was rushed to the hospital but didn't survive. The girls were charged with bone harassment. The Friday the 13th films feature hockey mask-wearing, machete-wielding Jason Voorhees as he sets out to punish anyone who dares come near Camp Crystal Lake, where he drowned after being left unattended by camp counselors. In 1988, at the height of the series' popularity, Massachusetts teen Mark Branch became obsessed with Jason, even allegedly coming to idolize and identify as the character. On October 24th of that year, a woman named Cheryl Gregory found her twin sister Sharon brutally killed. Police quickly suspected Branch. Although the exact reason why they suspected him was never made public, it's rumored that they found a pair of boots and a hockey mask, the same kinds worn by Jason, at the crime scene along with similar ones at Branch's home. Since the killings happened a week before Halloween and Branch remained at large, a local Halloween parade was canceled and trick-or-treating was rescheduled for daylight hours. Once deer hunting season started a month later, Branch's body was found hanging in the woods. Some internet sleuths have posited that Branch could have been lynched by angry locals who found him, or even that he'd been framed and was killed to cover it up, but the official police ruling was that he killed himself. The 1965 film The Collector features a man kidnapping a woman and locking her in the basement of his secluded farmhouse. It served as an inspiration for a couple of real-life killers about 20 years later. On June 2, 1985, Charles Ng was caught shoplifting a vice from a hardware store in San Francisco. A friend of his arrived and offered to pay for the stolen goods, but it was too late. The police had already arrived. When they checked the second man's ID, they discovered that it was actually someone else's, so they arrested both men. This ended up being the downfall of two of the deadliest serial killers of the 80s. The friend, Leonard Lake, killed himself by swallowing cyanide pills that he'd smuggled into jail. Ng, however, escaped and fled to Canada. Lake and Ng had been partners for what they called Project Miranda, in which they kidnapped and killed people at Lake's secluded cabin. By the time they were caught, they were believed to have killed 25 people. Ng was eventually extradited from Canada and put on trial. He was sentenced to death in 1999 and was still on death row as of a 2019 record of condemned inmates. If anyone deserves the death penalty, I would think he does. In the 1991 film Warlock, the title magical character is about to be put to death in 1690s America, but he's instead sent forward to the 1990s by Satan himself. He's tasked with finding a book that has the power to end the world. He's then pursued by a man from his own time who also went through Satan's time portal, as well as a woman from the 1990s. 14-year-old Sandy Charles was a fan of the film and reportedly became obsessed with it. In particular, he was interested in a scene in which the warlock kills an unbaptized child and then boils the dead child's fat to create a flying potion. 
Charles became so enamored with the idea that he recruited an eight-year-old boy, and they together planned to kill a seven-year-old child to attempt to make the warlock's flying potion. Charles and his young accomplice beat, mutilated, and cooked parts of their victim. Due to their ages, Charles was tried as an adult for the crime while his accomplice wasn't charged at all. Charles was found not guilty by reason of insanity and has been in psychiatric care ever since. Check out one of our newest videos right here! Plus, even more grunge videos about horror movies are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.